This is Basic Safari Base with Podcast. We did have one or two shows where you plug the box in and turn it on, and it was a 10 second show. This is Antic, the Atari 8 bit podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. The July-August 1987 issue of ST Log Magazine has an article uh, by Matthew Stern called Atari Sets Off Fireworks. It features an interview with Robert Valine of Astro Pyrotechnics, a California-based fireworks company. I'm going to read some snippets from that article. The Atari 800XL at Astro Pyrotechnics produces the most spectacular graphics you've ever seen. Its screen is the entire night sky. Sprites burst into ribbons of color. It can punctuate images with thunderous bangs and cannon bursts. The Astro Pyrotechnics Atari doesn't paint with pixels, it paints with fire. Astro Pyrotechnics is using Atari computers to run its fireworks business. Their computers not only produce information, they can produce an entire fireworks show. Instrumental in adapting Ataris to the fireworks industry is Robert Valine, who works in research and development. He brought his fascination with computers and electrical engineering to his profession. With Atari computers, Robert says, we are using technology to produce better art. Continuing later in the article, Robert and his stepbrother, Rick Rowley, designed and built a computer firing box with an Atari 800XL. A firing box is a device that sends an electrical charge to the fireworks to set them off. The Atari firing box is in a metal briefcase. Inside, there's a normal 800XL and cover. A small black and white TV serves as a monitor. The software has been transferred to a cartridge, so it's locked upon starting up. The box contains a built-in rechargeable battery that can run for an hour and a half. Most fireworks shows last just 15 minutes. Robert explained, it is still a functioning Atari. You can run basic programs on it, just as on any other Atari. But this firing box isn't like any other Atari. It contains additional features for testing and launching the fireworks. Instead of a normal on-off button, there's a locking switch. This prevents anyone from turning on the machine and launching the fireworks. Transistorized circuits send electrical charges to the fireworks when signaled by the computer. Four serial ports link the computer to up to four terminal boxes. Each box has five rows of screws, one screw for each queue. From the screws, workers attach long wires to electric machines, called squibs, which launch the fireworks. The firing box can launch up to 400 cues, each having 10 to 20 rounds of fireworks. Most shows use 100 to 150 cues. Fireworks can be launched manually or automatically. The firing box has a jack for plugging in a manual firing button. In live shows, like musical concerts at the Hollywood Bowl, fireworks are launched manually. Robert told me that, at a performance of the 1812 Overture, a firing button was given to the drummer so he could fire the cannon at the precise beat. For shows with pre-recorded soundtracks, fireworks can be launched automatically. The soundtrack sends a tone to the computer when a display is to be launched. The Atari firing box launches the next queue of fireworks. Robert keeps the manual firing button handy in case the computer doesn't receive the tone to launch the fireworks. After the show, the firing box indicates any fireworks that weren't launched. The crews can thus find out which fireworks may still be dangerous to make cleaning up much safer. Thanks to Wade at the 1632 Atari ST podcast for pointing me to that article in ST Log magazine. So I found Robert, who is still in the pyrotechnics industry, to get more of the story. This interview took place on June 2nd, 2017. Oh, one more thing. After our interview, Robert sent me pictures of his Atari-based firing box, as well as all of the software for running it, and the assembly language source code, and Old Mother Hubbard's G-Chip cookbook, his fireworks simulation software, and more. You'll find links to all that in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. Back even when I was a very young child, my dad used to buy us fireworks, and I would always save the old ones and play with them until I wore them out all year long until... He would get more. I always did like fireworks, and my father was a very supportive parent, and as I got old enough to be responsible, somewhere around 12, 13, 14, uh, he would go to the uh, Oregon Museum of Science and Industry at the time had a chemical store that you could buy chemicals to do experiments (laughs) with. Really? (laughs) Yeah. And so when I was in school, I looked up 
in Collier's Encyclopedia, they had a nice little section on fireworks. <laughs> and then, so I took those formulas and went with my dad, and we bought the chemicals, and I would sit out there and make stuff that didn't really work, but be all proud of it and drag my family out and show it to them in the backyard. <laughs> we lived in Washington State, was a nice green area, so I couldn't really hurt anything. And, and my dad said, as long as I behave myself, then he would support me. And so that is how I got to be into fireworks as a hobby. And as time went by, I, I got actually better and better at it. And, you know, it's just something that I love to do. And it was, it was great fun. So that's kind of like how I started my interest in the fireworks business. Nice. Um, the electronics part of it, um, my mom and dad were divorced when I was about eight, and my stepfather was an electronic genius. And so when we would visit him on the summer months and the weekends and stuff like that, I would get to see him making things like metal detectors and color organs in his basement from just like parts. And so that taught me that you can actually make stuff become real. And so I got interested in electronics uh, on, based on that. So I took a, a vocational course in electronics when I was in high school for a couple of years. And so that's kind of how I got into the electronic part of it. And then you fast forward a few years, and I puttered along with these different things like that and wasn't really going anywhere in my life. I was uh, kind of you know, suffering the uh, the late teens, uh, hoodlum-type blues and not really quite behaving and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And um, ended up being at our house in Washington all by myself, and I didn't have a job or money, and the electricity was turned off, and I didn't have food. So I would go visit my neighbors who would be kind enough to feed me every once in a while. And... Uh, they kind of introduced me to Pink Floyd. So we were listening to the Dark Side of the Moon album, and there's a song on that album called Time, which is ticking away the moments that make up a dull day. Sure. And fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way. And, you know, and the punchline is, is that, you know, you, you chase after the sun and you run and you run, but it comes up behind you and, life has passed you by. So all of these things together, that point of my life and that music that kind of hit a, a resonant note in my heart, I sat down and took stock of my life and said, well, you know, what am I going to do? Sit here starving to death in a house with no electricity for the rest of my life, or am I going to do something? And I said, well, I want to be somebody famous or somebody worthwhile to make an impact. And so I sat down and I said, well, what are my abilities? I like electronics. I like fireworks. I love rock and roll. Uh, I love pretty colored lights. And so if I put all of those together, maybe I can be something that is better than anybody else could be because of the parts that I have. And so I said, okay, that's it. And I'm going to go make fireworks for a living and shoot fireworks off in perfect time with music, alter people's consciousness, and teach them how to lead their lives right. So I packed up my suitcase and I came to California. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, so there I was. <laughs> um, by that time, my mom had moved to San Diego, so I got to go down there and we were pretending they would somehow be able to send me to college, which did not ever pan out. And I had a couple of jobs, but every time there was a concert or a fireworks show somewhere, I'd go and knock on the back gates and see if I could talk my way in to go tell the people, Hey, I'll work for free. If you'll just let me work on fireworks. And finally I did manage to talk my way into, uh, uh, the Elton John concert had some fireworks in the arena in San Diego, and I talked to a guy that was doing the pyro for that show. And he was happy to take me up on free labor, so he did other little shows and 
you got paid in a T-shirt and lunch. Wow. So <laughs> I did that for quite a while. And um, I can't imagine that sort of thing working anymore, just like knocking on the back <laughs> gate, going, hey, can I talk to your pyro guy? Sure, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's harder and harder, but, <laughs> you know, at the time it was the ancient, you know, golden age of innocence and sure. back in early 80s. And uh, so I got associated with this guy who got his, of course, pyrotechnics from some company that manufactured it. And I told him my dreams and what I wanted to do. And he says, well really, you ought to be working at the factory where they make this stuff, so I'll introduce you. So I called up and arranged a job interview. So I rode the bus from San Diego to San Bernardino and then walked 12 miles to the fireworks factory and showed up four hours late, and they were sitting there having a cup of uh, coffee at the end of the day, and the guy who I had the appointment said, you know, you're late. I said, yeah, but I had to walk. I didn't realize it was this far. <laughs> so he said, well, what would you have done if, if uh, we weren't here? And I said, well, I guess I would have sat on the front steps and waited till you got back. So that impressed him enough. It, at the time, the guy's name was Stuart Carlton, who was the manager of the factory. And he saw enough of a bright light that he took me out to dinner, and we kind of did the interview, and there I was. Um, can I ask you, just interrupt you for a second? Yeah. I, I had no idea that fireworks were manufactured in the United States. I thought it was completely all done in China. It, is that still the case that they're made here? Well, almost everything, I will say guardedly, everything that you shoot on the 4th of July for your own entertainment mm -hmm. is made in China. Yes, sir. Um, at the time, though... We were one of the very, very last manufacturing companies that existed in the United States making stuff for safe and sane for assortments for families, and that was Freedom Fireworks, whose brand name still exists, but it has now just been repackaged with stuff taken out of boxes and put on the stand to sell to uh, American consumers. And it is all made in China, and it's all prepackaged and everything else like that. So, okay. all right. So you got you got the job through. I your got the job persistence, and then and well, and then I did all of those things that you do at a job, which was mixing large amounts of comp and getting sulfur in your eyes, and your eyes burn. And we made stuff, and I did that. And this uh, person, Stuart Carlton, who was also an amateur pyrotechnician when he was a kid, he used to do shows for his town in Ohio, and some stage effects for his college at Overland. And so he would come in on the weekends and do it as a hobby besides running the factory. And I said, well, can I come in too and try some stuff? And he said, sure, kid, come on. And he kind of took me under his wing and we came in every Saturday and we'd go have breakfast and then we'd go to the factory and we'd make neat stuff. And we did that for a couple of years. And that company, Astro Pyrotechnics, and, that, and Freedom Fireworks, which was under the heading of Trojan Fireworks, had this display section, which was Astro Pyrotechnics, which is who the other guy worked for that I met originally. Okay. He, uh, or Astro Pyrotechnics, did displays, ship shows, high school shows, concerts, and things like that. And as the time went by on the weekends, Stuart and I doing things, and he let me become freer and freer, I started coming up with new things that actually were actually pretty good. They were worthwhile. They were neat things. And the manager of the division of Astro Pyrotechnics, whose name was Gene Evans, he started to see that stuff and said, hey, that's pretty cool because we put that at the Hollywood Bowl or use it at Universal Studios. And I said, sure, man. And we continued doing this on the weekends for quite a while. And then he started asking for, well, can you do this? And can you do that? And then I would develop those and he'd go, yeah, that's it. And then we'd sell it to our customers for, for example, was, what can you give an example of something that he wanted done and that you created? Well, um, 
You know, they do special effects in amusement parks like Universal Studios. We'll start there. Back in the very, very old days, Universal Studios uh, and Disney, they didn't really have fireworks. Disney did on a nightly basis, but that was fireworks, fireworks. But Universal Studios was doing shows like The A-Team. And, sure, stunt uh, shows and things like that. Right, stunt yeah. shows. It's currently that same venue now does uh, Waterworld. And right. they drive around little boats and shoot each other with guns, and things blow up, and it's all very exciting. And then they reload it and shoot another one, and they do five or ten of them a day. Well, so we started developing stuff for this first time ever. Universal was going to do live pyro in their, in their theme park. And we uh, installed the A-Team show, and I developed articles for that. So as this now became more and more uh, popular, uh, eventually the guy that ran Astro said, I'll tell you what, we should put you on the Astro salary and have you do R&D instead of working out there in the factory. And so we developed uh, a lot of the stuff or all of the stuff that was for the A-Team stunt show at the Universal Studios in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And then that progressed from there. They opened another show, which was called Conan the Barbarian, where wizards turned people into stone and did all kinds of neat things like that. And I developed the pyrotechnic effects for that. And so that was, historically speaking, probably one of the first installations of uh, amusement park using special effects in an ongoing stunt show venue in their parks. And that has continued over the years. Um, it went from A-Team to Miami Vice and Conan to the Beetlejuice Rockin' Review and, and Miami Vice to Waterworld and... There was the Wild West stunt show, and all of these things had things that mm -hmm. blew up and made smoke. Mm -hmm. And so back then, that team, Astro Pyrotechnic, Stuart Carlton and Gene Evans and myself, were the ones that made the original pyrotechnics that started theme, theme park special effects used in ongoing venues. And... Um, that went on happily for about 10, 10 years there. Eventually, um, we were all huddled out there in Rialto, California. There was uh, some military bunkers that um, were left over from the war that they used to store munitions in. So that's where all of the fireworks companies would huddle together and keep their stuff in storage because they could rent the bunkers rather than have to build one. Oh, cool. Um, so there were three or four or five companies out there. Um, one of them had a person working there that um, was having difficulty with his wife and Things. And so one day he decided he was going to stack everything in a big pile in the bunker and call his wife and say, hey, look this way, and he lit it all. Uh, this generated a shockwave that was heard for 10 or 15 miles and through pieces of cement for as much as a half a mile away and completely crushed all of our buildings and our manufacturing facility. Yikes. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So at that time, the company that was responsible for it didn't have the money to repair us, the liability of fixing that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so what they did instead was they bought us, at which point they turned the place upside down and pretty much started to empty it out and kept the contracts and got rid of the people that were expensive <laughs> to to keep the ones who had actually done all of this. Mm -hmm. And so we all scattered to the winds. Um, I went to Alabama and, and worked for a company called Lunatech, uh, did special effects and rock shows like Kiss and things like that. 
and I stayed there for about a year, but that did not pan out for reasons of uh, incompatibility with the owner, and, and, and it just wasn't working like I had understood it was going to. Mm-hmm. And Stuart kind of came along, and he worked there for a while, and then eventually, after about a year, that all kind of fell apart. And then I started looking around for, okay, where am I going to go now? And I knew that there was a company here in California called MP Associates that was currently trying to get the shows at Universal Studios away from what was left of Astro Pyrotechnics. So after having waited a year and figuring there was no conflict of interest, um, I got in contact with uh, the owners of the company and said, hey, you know, I invented all that stuff. Uh, I understand you're trying to figure out how to make it and reproduce it. Uh, I could probably help. And they said, sure, come on down. (laughs) So I came back to California. Nice. And I got hired, and we did just that. We uh, redeveloped new product based on on what was going on at that time. And I have been here at MP Associates for the last 28 years. Hmm. Nice. And this is what I do. (laughs) Oh, nice. So you're still there, and you're still – normally at the end of the interview, I ask, what do you do today? But you're, you're still doing pyro? Yeah, after 40 years professionally, I am now at what is probably the world's foremost pyrotechnic manufacturing facility. Wow. Um, We uh, manufacture special effects for use in stage and movies, and uh, we make military simulators, but we do not make anything to kill people with, I refuse. And they use that for training. You know, they'll they'll have a bunch of their guys sitting in a restaurant, and they'll take a car out there and blow it up, and or make it look like it blew up without hurting anything, and see how they react. And so they use this for training and battlefield simulation and stuff like that. So that's a large part of our actual bread and butter, which we do that we don't really like to do, but we that pays the bills. And then over here, on the other hand. Um, I am still providing pyrotechnics to Universal, Universal in Hollywood and their current shows, and Universal Studios in Florida, and Universal Studios in Japan, and Universal Studios in Singapore. Wow. And so we are manufacturing products here in this itty-bitty little burg of Ione, California, and sending it to the world. In addition, besides rock and roll tours like all of the special effects that uh, the Rolling Stones have done and ACDC and Motley Crue and all of that kind of stuff, uh, we also provide pyrotechnic special effects the up close and personal stuff not the big things that go in the air we don't make Mm -hmm. that kind of thing we make very highly controlled very repeatable close proximity pyrotechnics that are guaranteed and absolutely must work so the the kind of the kind of things you 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 buy for fourth of july to do in the backyard with your kids that that sort of thing no nothing like that no this is this is well, I mean, this is the stuff, if you go to Waterworld show today and sit down in the front row, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you, they'll shoot pyrotechnics probably 25 feet away from you five times a day. Right, right. Right there as an audience member every day, day after day. And at Disneyland, you know, the, the Main Street fireworks show, it's got the big stuff behind the castle. We don't do any of that. But there's all of the little stuff off of the front of the castle and off of the rooftops and on mm-hmm. Main Street, you know, that's right there by the people so that you're kind of immersed in it. That material we provide. Cool. So we provide that to Disneyland and Disney World and Disney in Shanghai, which is the punchline that I was getting to. So I, I, I can't help. But giggle to myself, you know, as we celebrate the 4th of July as Americans with all pyrotechnics made in China, that we are here in the United States 
sending it back to them and charging it for, <laughs> charging <laughs> them for. <laughs> it just makes, it just makes me giggly. <laughs> nice. Okay, so I want to hop in the the uh, Wayback Machine and talk more specifically about using the computers to fire off pyrotechnics. Um, so we saw this in an article in uh, ST Log Magazine, July August 1987 issue. First of all, do you know how this article came about? Did you know the author Matthew Stern, or just how did how did they discover you? Yeah. Um, okay, so. Meanwhile, Stuart Carlton, who was a, a research and development uh, technician that worked at TRW and was instrumental in developing processes for which purifying titanium, and they they just did R and D projects for the government and uh, a big industry. And he had this as a hobby, and as I said, I would go in on the weekends with him, and. So uh, I liked playing video games like that, and and we were gonna kind of. I, I ended up uh, living with him for uh, a while, and we ended up wanting to get a game machine because I wanted one. And at that time is when the Atari four hundred had just come out. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, why don't we get a computer? Because you can put any game in that that you want, and you can still use it as a computer. So that's what we did. We bought an Atari 800 and Basic and started doing fun things like trying to draw fireworks on the screen and Basic and doing things like that. And so that developed, and we did that, and we did the pyro, and you know it was it was all good geek fun for technically oriented guys. And so we got into the Atari on that basis. There was this little store in Ontario, California, uh, not too far away from where the we lived in the factory was, and we went to uh, there to get the Atari stuff. It was an Atari store. And there I met a scoundrel whose name was Phil D'Angelo. And he, I don't know, we just hit it off with him and, and, and we go there every weekend and look at, you know, drool over new programs like Caverns of Mars and, (laughs) you know, Sea Dragon and all of that neat old stuff. And, We'd get games and play them and do basic programming. And, and Phil D'Angelo worked there as a salesman, and we got to be friends and, and had dinner and listened to music together and all of that neat stuff with his kids and his wife. And um, that just kind of grew and kind of helped inspire this thing with the, uh, with the computer. Well, he was kind of a, a, I don't know, not necessarily a hustler, but a guy that would get things done and was always having some kind of great thing to do or another. And so during this time that we had the computer, just for the heck of it, I developed a program along with Bill D'Angelo and Stuart uh, that drew... Basically, it's what it, what the screensavers look like now. Okay, the Atari 800 had all of these 256 glorious colors and the G chip and all of that neat stuff. And I liked colors and fireworks, and so the whole thing just kind of just worked together. And so I made a program called Mother Hubbard's G chip cookbook, which is um, written in Basic and was out there and Phil saw that and he was over in his own little world and somehow got connected to, uh, I forget what the name, I think it was star. They had a dot matrix printer, which was one of the first color printers that was available for the Atari was four color ribbon. Right. Star micronics printer, I think. Yeah. Right. So, he saw this G-Chip cookbook and actually made a video of it with some original music from a synthesizer guy that was his friend, and that's now on YouTube. Um, I believe it's called Nightline. And it was the G-Chip cookbook 
videotaped, <laughs> cut and pasted together in time with the music to make one uh, a, a computer animated video. And he got somehow connected to this color printer through his connections and the mm-hmm. people he knew. And so we were going to sell Mother Hubbard's or give Mother Hubbard's G-Chip cookbook away with the color printer so that people would print out lots of printouts and use lots of ink and sell more color printers. And so (laughs) (laughs) he, (laughs) in addition to that, which we did do, which I found those discs also, as well as the assembly language disc for the firing box. Oh, nice. Uh, And I'll get copies of that to you somehow. The... G Chip Cookbook and his associations there. He ended up knowing somebody, I believe, called Lee Pappas. Sure, yeah, Analog Magazine that was the yeah ST Log Magazine, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so he knew about the Fire and Box and the G Chip Cook and all the stuff that we're doing, and so that's how we got introduced to ST Log and how they found out about it. He had connections somewhere else, and then one day he said, hey, ST Log wants to do an article on your firing box. What do you think? We said, yay, okay. <laughs> nice. And, and that's how that one went. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, and along in there, some of the other people, Paul Heckel wrote a program called Zoom Racks, which was a database for the Atari mm-hmm. and... Um, now the magazine, so that was on the Atari ST. The magazine said that you used Zoom Racks to uh, know what particular uh, equipment, what pyro stuff you were going to need That's for a right. particular we, show. We yeah. used it to generate the packing list and the and what we call a pull sheet, a packing list uh, uh, of the articles and where the lo- where the locations were. You know, there was the articles and how many of them in one field and what location they went on. And that was a lot for the Hollywood Bowl. Um, Gene Evans had connections with the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra and did special effects for the the uh, live performances at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm-hmm. And we would use the Zoom Rack stuff that Paul Heckel had written that was introduced to us by Phil D'Angelo and this whole little team, you know, we just kind of did things together, and it was a group having fun and in a very exciting new time when, yeah. you know, this was all becoming real. And so, yeah, we did. We used the the Zoom racks, and I still have some printouts from that. I managed to archive a little bit of stuff when I left in that at Astro Pyrotechnics. So we used VisiCal <laughs> on an Atari 800 to do all our formulas and the pricing for the safe and sane manufacturing that we did. And that was all Stuart because he knew how to use a spreadsheet. And Zoom Racks, he and I learned together. And we had Paul Heckel, and then there was Lee Pappas, and there was Phil D'Angelo. And, you know, we're all just frolicking around having a great time. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> nice. Um, all right, so tell me about the actual hardware. I mean, I've, I read the article. It sounds like you had the, the computer was hooked up to firing boxes, and then it could send off uh, 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 the charges at a particular time, you know, on based on a music track, or you could do it manually. It would also let you know if something didn't fire off, and then you'd be extra safe taking it Right, it was it done down. manually. So, um, yeah. The firing box got generated by, well, okay, we're interested in electronics. And as I said, my stepfather had a a very large brood. He had 11 kids, and I had stepbrothers. And they went to college, and they became actual electronic technicians and worked at various companies. Uh, One of them is the guy that wrote the, the, the design, the memory circuitry for the Sony PlayStation 3. Okay. Um, and his name was David, and then my other brother, stepbrother, was Rick, and 
I said, hey, let's make a firing box just so we can shoot fireworks at the Hollywood Bowl more better. And so we said, okay. And we all got together and we'd spend about a year, year and a half trying different things. We got an Atari XL computer and we used the parallel port. And with the data from the parallel port, we switched transistors on and off in an XY configuration with a diode matrix for each of the intersections. So, mm-hmm. and then we wrote uh, 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 somebody else who was a friend of my, one of my stepbrothers actually knew assembly language, and so he wrote the actual program for, like, debouncing switches and, and incrementing and keeping track of all of that. So we got the program. My two brothers did the electronic design. David did the CAD work and, and drew the circuit board. Rick had the friend that coded the, the assembly language and other friends that knew how to design switching power supplies, and he had the electronic expertise. And as a team, we shorted out several Atari 600 XLs and 800 XLs. <laughs> but we finally came up with something that we could stuff in a box, press a button, and then it shot fireworks. Wow. So this, was, this had to be the first time there was computer-controlled fireworks, right? Um, it was around the first time. I cannot, I cannot take credit for it. There is a company called Pyro Digital who um, had generated a, a firing system that worked off of time code and incremented the cues based on, a, on the time code played as a one track and then the music on the other track. And they brought that thing out to sell to Astro Pyrotechnics for us to use. And it was, it was written and, and built around a K-Pro computer. And uh, they wanted too much money for it or it wasn't compatible with the type of firing systems that we already had. So we, just as a hobby, developed our own. But they were actually in possession of a commercially viable firing system, which, by the way, now Pyro Digital is what is considered one of the industry standards uh, of firing systems for the world. It's used uh, uh, everywhere. But we made our own knockoff version slightly different with a computer control and all in one box instead of having things that plugged into the back of a K-Pro. And that's how that went. So we weren't the very, very, very first, but we were certainly right in there with them. Amazing. So tell me, uh, you mentioned the other day that a couple of Ataris got blown up. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, we shorted several of them out. Okay. Oh, you don't mean like blown up like py- in a pyro? No, no, way. no, not not, not <laughs> like explosively okay. blown up like uh, electronic nerd screw up blew uh, up. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> More interfacing problems than anything else. <laughs> but did you did you have were there ever any problems with the system where you something went went wrong? I mean, even in a, a smaller way than. No, actually, um, it was it was a it was a pretty simplistic thing. You know, it's it had a twenty by twenty matrix, twenty on the ground and twenty on the on the positive, and you would have a diode matrix that hooked up to those that X Y, and that would just fire it. And this stepped just stepped through it, so it was basically a simple counter. You press the button, and it goes next. You could type in a number and change where you were at the time. All of the fireworks and and things like that, at like at the Hollywood Bowl, were fired live because it was live music. So a guy had a button in his hand, and he pressed what he knew was the show on cue in time with the music. Mm-hmm. And then at like Magic Mountain, which we also did the the fireworks for on a nightly basis. They had a time track and a code that sent out a pulse that went beep, 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 and then that would increment the box from one cue to the next. And then you would, you would wire it up based on 
on the order in which it went and make sure that the that the proper item was on circuit one and the next one was on circuit two. Um, there were one or two occasions when, like amusement parks, they're full of electricity and they have lakes, and then they want to shoot the fireworks on the water, and you want to put the fireworks on the water, and the cables go through the lake, and there's all kinds of electrical stray currents in everywhere. And we did have one or two shows where you plug the box in and turn it on, and it was a 10-second show. <laughs> <laughs> we got a couple of those. <laughs> and we finally figured out that what you have to do is put the cables going underwater in a garden hose and make sure both ends were above the water so that they couldn't get shorted out. So, yeah, we did have a couple of exciting adventures as far as, uh, you know, a very, very uh, exciting show for about 10 or 15 seconds. Hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I re just reading this article, it said that at least in, in one case, you, you gave uh, a firing control to the drummer so that uh, he could he could control yeah, that was the, the, the explosion the Hollywood time Bowl. Yeah, Yeah, the percussionist at the Hollywood Bowl, they did the 1812 Overture. And there, uh, there were racks of, I think, like 100 cannon shots, right? And so we actually ran a cable to the percussionist, and he would hit the button at the right time to fire the, what were just noisemakers for the cannon shots in, in the 1812 overture. <laughs> That's awesome. And it also said the other thing I thought was interesting was that you could selectively disable things due to weather. I guess if the winds are too high, you might want not. That's use right. It. Yeah, you yeah you could flag different things out. You, the, the, there was a, I guess you would call it a an entry in the database of the computer that you could say don't fire. So you could assign a priority code of some kind or another to a series of effects, like the things that go really, really high. You still want the cannon shots because they don't hurt anything and they're on the ground and they just make noise. But you might not want to shoot the comets that go 200 feet high if you, it's a gale force wind and it's fire season. Sure. So you could, yeah, you could lock out one bank of stuff or something and you would put them all uh, on that and then flag them and then you had the ability to go in and take them out, but still continue with the rest of the show, even if it had a few gaps. How long was the Atari in service in this capacity? Um, well, it was in service while I think I was still there for another four years or so, and then it got left because it was owned by Astro Pyrotechnics when this other company took over. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it turns out that some of us stayed there and kind of held on to the bitter end. Some of us escaped immediately. And one of the people that stayed there was one of the major technicians, Jeff Marsh, that did, he was the crew leader for the setup for the Hollywood Bowl and Knott's Berry Farm and Magic Mountain. And he still worked for this company doing displays, and they still do the Hollywood Bowl yet today. And he said one day, uh, well, actually, what? It, fast forward, he eventually came to work for MP Associates. Stuart Carlton eventually came to work for MP Associates. The manager and assistant manager of production of Freedom Fireworks, who ran the girls and people that made the pyrotechnics, they eventually came to work for MP Associates because it's a very small world. There's only so many places that you can go. Mm -hmm. So we all ended up kind of back together. And, and eventually Jeff Marsh came back into the fold. And he'd been there at, at uh, Astro Pyrotechnics towards the end. And he said, you know, remember that firing box you made? It's sitting in the back warehouse. It doesn't work anymore. And it's just all covered with dust. And I said, could you get that for me? I know it's not worth anything, but it'd be really cool. And he yeah. said, ah, sure. And so he was still on good terms with them, and they gave it to him because it was at that point in time uh, not much of a functional machine. Um, 
And so now I have possession of it. Uh, the software, as I said, was written in assembly language. It was compiled and loaded onto a EE Prom cartridge with a battery backup mm-hmm. <laughs> that went into the cartridge slot of the Atari. And that has somehow disappeared. That is not with the box, but I still have the source code. And that may have been why it became non-functional. The battery went dead, and they didn't know how to fucking or how to replace it or anything like that. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, however, it ended up because I was not there. I did end up getting it back, and and uh, I know that it was in service for at least a good five years. I'm sure. Nice. So, do you still uh, have? Did did you get back the uh, in the picture here in the magazine? It's uh, the Atari's in a metal case with a little tiny black and white TV. I mean, do you still have the whole the full setup? Yeah, in fact, I have it torn apart, sitting on my desk in my office right now. And nice. I was going to see why it doesn't it, it doesn't turn on because now you got me all excited and expi- inspired again. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> nice. So I may I may I may breathe life into it oh, now because awesome. you know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I That's will good. take some pictures of it. The, yeah. I took it apart so as I can see if there was any burnt parts or anything, but I can give you some pictures of the inside of it, what the circuit board looked like, and the actual case and the whole thing mounted in there. And yeah, it had a little black and white <laughs> TV that popped up, and we had some, uh, we had uh, lead acid gel cells for the battery pack, and. Um, the firing part ran off of 24 volts, and, and then we had the, a power supply specially built that supplied the 24 volts for the power uh, firing and the uh, voltage to run the computer and voltage to run the monitor and stuck it all in a suitcase, and it weighs probably about 70 pounds. It's a beast, but uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. It says here in the article that it said you hope to one day design fireworks on your computer, and I'm wondering if you got to do that, or is that that's is that how it's done today? Well, there there are a few good fireworks emulation programs out there, uh, even in public domain, and uh, the the pyrotechnic shows are now choreographed and designed by computer. The, the way that it is commonly done, even for all of the different brands of systems that are out there, you have a stereo track or a multi-track tape. And on one track is the music. And on the other track, the way that the uh, pyro digital system works and most of the other ones, they put frequency shift keying, FSK code, which is like what you hear when you press a dial tone or press your buttons on your uh, phone, right? It's uh, two tones together to make right, a sure. combination thereof for digits. Well, so on the other track, you record basically one, two, three, four, five, every 24 times a second, and you just count. And then you put, you play the tape, and you run the counter into your firing system. And when you want to see fireworks, you press the button, and it logs into the database that there will be a Q fired at 1 minute, 57 seconds, and 3 frames. Mm-hmm. And so it'll remember that. So now you have a list of, at this time, fire this circuit. At that time, fire the next circuit. At that time, fire the next circuit. Mm-hmm. And I imagine there's a... It. I'm sorry. I, mean, I imagine there's a there's a latency, right? I mean, it, it takes a few seconds to get up in the air and start doing it. Right. Its and, thing. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And so, since you're doing this on a computer, you can put what is called a pre-fire in on that firing cue. So, if I have a, uh, I want to shoot something in the air that say has to go up into the air for two seconds before it actually lights. That means I have to fire it two seconds before the actual cue, right? Sure. So you will tell the database, instead of firing it at 1 minute and 57 seconds, fire it at 1 minute and 55 seconds. That way at 
one minute and 57 seconds, it will actually go off on cue. And that's all done in the software. Then you download that to the box, and all it knows is that it's firing at one minute and 55 seconds. It doesn't know that you're trying to compensate for timing and stuff sure. like that. Yeah. So as a, as a layperson, what is new in, in pyrotechnics today that would surprise me? Oh, golly willikers. Now, I, here at MP Associates, I, 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 you know, and it's not just uh, the fact that this is the company that I've been at for the last 30 years, but uh, we are the foremost provider of pyrotechnic high-performance it must work under any conditions, uh, special effects in the world. And uh, <laughs> so as the political climate has changed, there has been concerns over air pollution. There's concerns over environmental impact. And so we here at MPA have been the industry leaders in providing environmentally friendly, low-smoke pyrotechnics. Hmm. And that is a new and exciting thing that, that we developed here at this company. And so in order for instance, there, there to continue to be shows down in the Los Angeles area, the Air Quality Management District forced people to make a significant effort to reduce the smoke. And then there were environmental concerns over one, some of the chemicals that were commonly used in pyrotechnics. And we developed a whole new line of product that was very low smoke and did not contain the toxic chemicals that the, the regulatory ag agencies were concerned about. And those things are currently in all of the shows now that has just become the standard fare um, and also being I have never given up the geek side of my life I still have computers and I got myself a 3d printer <laughs> <laughs> so I am now printing out plastic parts that we use to figure out ways to launch pyrotechnics into the air more efficiently with even less quantity of material so that there is even less smoke and impact on the environment. And uh, they are current, some of those pieces are currently like being used the world over. And to me, that's awfully exciting. And it's still computer oriented, although I'm not doing it on an Atari anymore, unfortunately. I've got an <laughs> IBM compatible, but but I got my 3D printer sitting on my desk at work and a 3D drafting program, and we're designing little parts that make us be able to use low smoke material to launch things into the air and, and reduce the environmental impact at, through a mechanical means, not just a chemistry means. And that kind of stuff is really exciting to me um, as yeah. far as neat and new. Very cool. Very nice. Um, what haven't I asked you about the Atari days that I should have? Oh, golly willikers. Well, um, we used the, the computer a lot for games. We used it, like I say, for this Mother Hubbard's g Chick cookbook, which was just making neat graphics, and and eventually used it for a firing system, and we moved on from the 800 to an 800XL, and eventually, yay, got ourselves an Atari ST. And that's about where the, the 520 ST, and that's where we kind of ended up at. And then they kind of sort of disappeared, and then we moved on to IBM since then. But... Um, the whole the whole computer thing at that time you know it was all brand new it was all very exciting it, there was this this life in the people you know we it, you you met somebody else that you know had an atari computer like you were instant friends you know we we went 
my my girlfriend and I, who is now my wife of thirty some years, uh, we went and took Pascal programming and basic programming at the Atari users groups in Ontario, and we write the G chip cookbook together, and we would draw a little. Stuart actually knew the math to three dimensionally plot an aerial show going off, which uh, you know just like a single shell burst, you know, goes bang, and then the stars mm-hmm. expand out, and then we included gravity for the stars to go down, and plotted the curve with uh, trigonometry so that the 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 little dots of light were moving realistically. Uh, At that point, on an Atari 800 written in BASIC, it went about the speed of a glacier. But over the period of a half hour or so, you could watch a show go up and burst, you know? (laughs) 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 So that was pretty exciting, you know? And we'd sit there, pat ourselves on the back, and go, yeah, wasn't that really, really neat? And you'll go, yeah, sure was. (laughs) You know? (laughs) 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 know. (laughs) Nice. Cool. The main thing was it was that there was such a a sense of of excitement um and camaraderie in the whole in Atari community, you know, like I say, Phil D'Angelo, he had his connections, and we all had our own little lives and specialties. He's an artist, and hence he did that that video called Night Run, which is the g chip cookbook it's set in time to uh, original music. And uh, and he's the one who introduced me to Lee Pappas, and, and, and that's how the article got written, and we all became friends. And so, you, you know, it's just this community of scoundrels <laughs> and that got together that were just doing this because it was the neat, new, exciting thing. I mean, it was, it was cutting edge. It was, it, it was great. And so we would just do things for the heck of it, you know. <laughs> Nobody had ever done this before, so there was no rules, and so we just kind of did what we wanted. It was very, very exciting times. And if you've looked up the uh, that uh, the Valine color system, which was this other little thing that I did, it was one of the things that I did at Astro that convinced them to actually pay me to do this for a living, um, where you could make red, green, blue, and orange, and then you could mix them like light in order to make any color of the rainbow that you wanted. Hmm. You could literally make 20 colors between red and blue that went from blue to indigo to red, magenta, rose, pink, and all of that. On that paper published about 30-some years ago is my phone number and my email address, and that is all still out there. And that those formulas have been released to public domain nice. because so many people in those growing years of my time provided things to me, and I gathered information that was the work of other people that put it out in public domain, and they, they selflessly gave to everybody out there. And... So I gave that back as some small piece of a way to give it back. So my phone number has been the same for the last 28 years, as well as my email address for some 20 years or whatever it's been. We can talk about, I could send you the floppy disk. I don't know if I have the pieces to put back together. I think I do have an operating 800 uh, Atari in a box. My Atari ST still boots. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and yeah, I, would, I might be able to make copies of them, but it certainly would be good to archive all of that stuff and get it like on a USB drive or something. Yes, absolutely. And I have the, yeah, if you lend me the disks, I have the hardware to move it to a modern computer. And then uh, you can have, a, you know, you'll have a copy and then hopefully you'll allow me to share that with the Atari community just so that they right, can yeah. see how it worked, you know? Yeah, that, that'd be perfectly fine. Um, um, you know, I don't give a lot of formulas about pyrotechnics or anything like that away because that's of course how we make our living but those things i i'm perfectly willing to put into public domain and let anybody enjoy them that could because um, i do like to give back to the community somewhat <laughs> well i really thank you for <laughs> you know caring and being interested in it <laughs> oh super much yeah this is uh 
this is so interesting, and, and thank you so much for your time today. We'll chat again, and if you come up with any further questions, or if I find anything else neat and exciting that I have forgotten to tell you about, I'll let you know. Great. Cool. You have a wonderful day. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org/donate. Thanks.